Well, here we are again, yeah. Arnold, and um, I'd like to uh, continue with yeah. it. The open air bus is a good oh, place to Oh, that marvellous. Oh, what an attraction. The open air bus. The amazing thing is that, well, it was opened in, in June of 1916 by Mrs Astley. She was the wife of the local MP. Oh, they, on that day that they, they opened, uh, it... Uh, they had thousands turn up. Of course, there's the usual turnstile there. Uh, and there were fantastic swimming displays. Of course, at that time, uh, you got the old black and white movies show, showing swimming displays, uh, you know, radial swimmers. Yeah. Uh, and if you remember when you've seen the film of the open air bass, they actually had uh, a section where an orchestra played. And, and they had an orchestra playing. Must have been a fantastic day, June of 1916. But that, that was when the bass was finished. But it was probably started in about 1914. Imagine that just at the outbreak of the First World War, where the young people living in St Anne's, the young men, they'd gone off to fight in the war. So it was the more mature craftsmen who were left behind to build this. Well, there was no promenade in those days. And, and they built the baths straight onto the sand. So they must have dug out the baths, which was an Olympic sized pool, dug out it, uh, built the filtration plants, put the pipe work in to bring salt water in. Uh, and uh, 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 at times when they were very high tide, the tide must have come all the way around the walls of the baths. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, whenever I, uh, um, the baths held one million gallons of seawater, imagine that. And whenever anybody says to me, well, uh, when you think of a million, uh, what do you think of a million? And I say, well, I immediately think of the St. Town's open air pool. Yeah. Yeah. And what an amazing thing it was. How did they, had... they clean the wards then? Ah, well, they brought the water in. First of all, it came into uh, an area which we all bricked off, a, a huge area which was a, a settling tank. The settling tank, once the water was still, all the sand in suspension dropped down to the bottom of the uh, uh, settling tank. Then it went through filters. They, they probably had mineral filters and then it had a chlorine, chlorine treatment and then it was released into the swimming pool. So by the, by the time it got into the pool it was a beautiful blue, mm. blue colour, marvellous. Mm. And you've seen the film of the open air baths. Uh, you start a great long stretch it was and it, 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 you had a shallow end. A very long shallow end and you gradually went in uh, and uh, part way in perhaps about 10-15 yards in there was some uh, uh, like concrete pillars with ropes yeah, stretching yeah. between them which prevented the non-swimmers from uh, uh, from going any further that was a warning yeah uh, and they had these fantastic high diving boards, the long slides uh, uh, and you get on the top of this slide and slide down then the temperature of water hit you, a uh, real shock yeah, yeah, to the system cold. and uh, my father, he, 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 he was in retail looking after his shop uh, and he hadn't got time to teach me to go and swim like so many fathers so the instructions were you go into the pool, go down in the shallow end and then, you know, up to about your waist and then try and lie absolutely flat on the bottom of the pool. So, of course, when you try and do this, lie absolutely flat on the bottom of the pool, what happens? You float up. And once you start floating up, then you start kicking your legs and splashing your arms about and you're swimming. 
And that's how we all learned to swim yeah, yeah, yeah. from there. Marvellous thing. Uh, and then later on, uh, they, they had swimming galas. But that sunbathing pitch, uh, oh, it, it must the sunbathing pitch alone must have held about 300 people all lying down on the towels. Uh, and uh, there was a, a group, and I haven't got to mention any names because it's, it would be very embarrassing, a particular section of the community of St Anne's in the very upper crust would have their servant go along to the baths first thing before anybody had really arrived and lay out towels in a particular corner of, of, uh, of the sunbathing pitch. That was the corner nearest the changing rooms, mm. sheltered from the prevailing wind mm. and just angles that they got the maximum benefit of the sun. And they call this area the Royal Box. The, from the sunbathing pitch was just a little bit of a raised ledge. And so we would arrive at normal time and there were all these highfalutin people all stretched out, suitably bronze. But uh, as the baths went on, uh, so there were all sorts of events. Of course, every year they held the uh, St. Anne's Open Air Beauty Competitions there. Uh, that attracted crowds of people. Uh, but uh, we, they were so good with the baths that you became hardened. And, and uh, I was working in a shop, and so during my lunch hour, I'd jump on my bike, ride down to the baths, whether it was raining or not, and get into the pool, do a few lengths, and get back within the hour. Within the hour. It was wonderful. Uh, and uh, uh, on these gala days, you, you had the famous stars, the stars that would uh, be appearing in uh, Blackpool. You know, people like Joseph Locke and Al Reed and uh, Rubberneck, Nat Jacqueline, all that lot would come along in, 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 in fancy costumes uh, to parade round the pool. Uh, Joseph Locke, I can remember his outfit. It, it, it was a mixture between an escaped convict and a policeman. He had a policeman's yeah. helmet on, yeah. then a one-piece costume with black and white, white vertical stripes on. Stripes on. Hilarious! Mm -hmm. uh, and then, oh, I don't know. When would when would the bath close? About the uh, seventies. Oh, in the seventies, uh, and uh, we, a great petition was organised to save the pool. Uh, just a few years before the pool was closed, uh, they tried heating the pool. Really? Heating the pool. Uh, oh, Mr. Drinkwater, who looked after the heating and the changing rooms, he said, come in Arnold, have a look at the, the furnace. So I went in and looked at this furnace. There was a six inch gas main to heat one million gallons of water. Only just took the chill off. Uh, and you look through this inspection chamber of this furnace. Uh, bright blue flame roaring away. Uh, and uh, so, uh, eventually, what happened is that the council, uh, in their wisdom, they, they said the pool was faulty. Well, a lot of us disagreed with this. They said, oh, there's a, a crack in the bottom of the pool. Well, in our opinion, uh, the crack just needed uh, repairing. And then someone else said, ah, well, they expensive pump that pumps the water into the pool from the sea uh, needed fixing. Uh, then others said, you see the pipe which filled the baths went just out to the sea. Well everything was all right when he had that north run, when he had the channel, deep channel, running in front of what is now the promenade. Uh, so it was a pipe just straight into there uh, and then they could fill the bath. Yeah. But in the years just before they closed the open air bath, that inlet pipe got covered in sand, a huge depth of sand. And before they could consider filling the bath, they had to go out and start digging the sand away uh, to expose the open end of the pool to, to bring the water in. Well, a combination of all this lot, uh, and in spite of all our 
protestations. Over a thousand people signed the signatures uh, to save the pool. It, it, it closed. And, and that, that was the story uh, of the open air pool. The, the rest is well known. You changing into yeah. cinemas yeah. and a, yeah. uh, all sorts of complexes, well, gambling casino. Let's um, we go over to it some what, another thing. The majestic. Oh, free the city of the hydro was it? Uh, yes. Well, uh, uh, originally, uh, when would the, uh, uh, that building start? Probably uh, uh, early 1900. Mm. Uh, and in those days. It was called the Imperial Hydro. Oh, yeah. And even today, when you look uh, uh, at the gateposts, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it's still got on the gatepost leading to yeah, the what yeah. is now the Majestic. Yeah, yeah. But it's still got IH yeah. uh, on, on there, the Imperial Hydro. Mm. Well, in those days, uh, the people living in the, uh, in the country thought that the secret of health was to come to the seaside bathe in the salt water and some of them were even mad enough to drink this salt water <laughs> but the uh, the basement of the majest of the imperial hydro uh, had got these baths where people would go and lie in uh, salt water yes. and, and because the peer company owned the foreshore rights they considered themselves to own the seawater out there and they, they, there was a chap employed on St Alan's Pier who would take bucket loads of salt water over to the Imperial Hydro and the Imperial Hydro had to pay him for bringing this, the seawater over. And that was tipped into the baths where it was sort of heated up a bit and there these people would lie in it convinced that they were, uh, that they were going to get beneficial uh, things from there. Well, it, that went on for quite a number of years uh, and, and then, of course, the Imperial Hotel in Blackpool opened uh, and so in order that you didn't get the two mixed up, uh, they changed the name to Majestic. But in those early days, uh, up above, right on the front paraffin, looking out to sea, there was a, a, a sort of big metal uh, statue uh, of Britannia sitting on her throne and holding a, a spear uh, uh, and uh, uh, the same sort of model you got on the old penny pieces you know the front of the old penny pieces uh, had this picture of the uh, Britannia real Britannia was that on the, the end yeah the, the end looking out onto the sunken garden was it on there up to the 70s when the, the hotel was demolished? Oh, oh no, it, that was demolished. I think that was taken away when the, when the Second World War started. Right. Because they were forever after metal. They used to take yes. the big gates yes. down and the railings, mm. all to be melted down yes. for the war effort. Mm. Uh, and so uh, they were, it changed from the Imperial Hotel to the Majestic and where the brine baths were down below in the basement that was all fitted out with uh, uh, a gambling casino down there and uh, uh, a superb uh, bar they called it the captain's cabin down below uh, uh, in uh, uh, the basement uh, and uh, uh, it, it, I had my first pint of bitter there. Uh, I got into some bad company uh, who insisted that I drank a pint of this bitter. And to me it tasted horrible. I think, and, I, think I had my first pint yeah. of bitter. And I, 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 I emptied half of it into, the, <laughs> into a plant <laughs> pot containing an aspidistra. <laughs> uh, 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 just, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the first pint. Mm. down there uh, 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 and then uh, there was a gambling casino down there I didn't get mixed up with that then uh, I shouldn't be telling all this 
But I, um, my parents had a, a business that uh, hired out cots and mattresses to the hotel uh, place and hired chairs. And I would, during the season, I'd regularly go in there. And sometimes I, I went in through, into the kitchens. And the, and the kitchens were horrible. Uh, right down in the basement. The kitchens, the floor, was thick with grease. You could get a spade and scrape the grease up. And yet up above it was all silver service and the waiters all dressed up in the finery. And I thought, if these posh people eating could only see the kitchen down below, perhaps they wouldn't eat those meals. And then, I used to work in there. Did you? Yeah. Really? Yeah, in the 70s, early 70s. And you remember that ballroom? Oh. What a marvellous ballroom. Sprung ballroom. I think it was parky floor. And, mm. uh, and then all around the ballroom was like a balcony mm. where people could watch all the dancing going on. Uh, and then they had a little orchestra also tucked away at the end there. Uh, 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 Grand times. They were grand. Even, oh, uh, even Winston Churchill went and stayed, stayed there. And there were, there's loads of photographs of him yeah. coming out, standing on the steps yeah. in the Majestic. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the orchestra at one time was uh, led by a chap called Gerald Bright and his orchestra. Later on, he changed his, the name of the band to Geraldo. Yeah. 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 Marvellous. And, and uh, I, I would have to go there and uh, I'd have to get, get the money to pay for the hire of the cots and mattresses and high chairs and things. They never went to, went to the reception desk. They'd say, oh, leave the bill. Well, if you left the bill there, it might take a month or so before you ever saw your money. But I found that the accountant who handed out the money was on the first floor. So I'd bypass the, the, the desk, the reception desk. And I'd go up to this first floor, bang on the accountant's door, and he'd say, come in. And he'd say, oh, it's Arnold. I said, yes, I come for the money. Oh, he said, right. And he'd get the money out of his cash box and get paid straight away. Yeah. But those are the days of the Majestic. Yeah, 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 yeah. And round the back uh, of the Majestic, looking out to what, uh, what is now, what? Being in bargains and all that. Uh, oh, where the pub is now. Yeah, yeah. That used to be a, a, a tennis court. Yeah. Oh, there'd be about three big full-size tennis yeah. courts there. Marvellous. Mm. And, and so that's very much a snippet uh, of the Imperial Hydro yeah, 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 and the yeah. story of the Majestic Hotel. Uh, uh, Carnegie Library. Yes, isn't that marvellous? Probably yeah. built about... 1906, something like that, uh, with funding from Carnegie, who made uh, millions of pounds out of the oil industry in America. Uh, and he obviously was very interested in education. And he donated the money for some town's library to be built. And what a magnificent building it, it is. Uh, like you look at the front of it, and that's that marvellous. Uh, copper plated, copper, not copper plated, copper dome. Uh, beautifully shaped. Uh, in those days, so many buildings in St. Towns had the domes on the top. Uh, you know, across the road from the library is the Abbotsford House, now called the Richard Peck RAF Convalescent uh, Home. That's got a wonderful dome on it. Yeah. Next door to that is the what we always call is a technical college. That has wonderful domes on top. Uh, and so the library was formed and what a marvellous place it was. They had the reading room there, perfect silence in there. All the daily newspapers were available for anyone free of charge to go in there and read the morning, morning paper. Uh, fantastic arrangement of books uh, and uh, so, oh, uh, I can always remember my older sisters used to go and get loads of books from there. Far too many for them to read uh, in the time allocated. And of course they, uh, they'd go over the uh, reading time 
when they were due to send the books back. So to save their embarrassment, they used to tell me the, uh, to go and return these books and gave me suitable money. And, and so I would go and return these books and they, they'd look at me and tell me that there were fines to pay. And I had to produce all these pennies to pay for the fines. And, and uh, so uh, there, after wonderful service, uh, that's uh, wonderful windows all the way around. Uh, and of course, surrounded by these gardens that the friends of the library are taking such care of now. Uh, and the place looks just as good as as ever it was. Yeah, the, and the, the, well, the place next door was built as a, a college building. Yes. Well, was that built about the same time? Yeah. About the same time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I, it was, well, the main building was, was built about 1906, 1908, something yeah. like that. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I used to walk past it and what, what always uh, very rarely did I go actually go in yeah. but yeah. as you walk round yeah. the side yeah. up Links, Links Road you could look down in the basement yeah. and there were all these lathes and woodworking and metalworking yeah. tools uh, uh, and it, it fascinated me uh, and again at the front there were these big flight of stairs uh, leading up to the uh, you know the what they effectively call the ground floor mm -hmm. uh, but there was some excellent work going on there uh, notable people who were I always remember one one chap uh, Hadley uh, Mr Hadley uh, he had a, a car showroom in Hove Road Hadley's garage he used to go in there and teach car maintenance there but there was all these specialised subjects and it it performed a wonderful function mm. and then it, eventually when it closed down uh, it was such a classic building uh, oh before tell it going on to that it joined the war uh, just before the war it was planned to expand it uh, and as you walk around the back there was unfinished buildings there but when the war came to an end you know, and when did the war end? 1945. Then building started again, and they had a, a marvelous big theatre in there at the yeah, back. Yeah, they did. Yeah, it, it was a, a marvelous place. Mm -hmm. And such a shame when eventually it 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 it, it closed down, yeah. uh, and there was a big campaign by the local civic society to to save that building. Well, at least not to knock the, not to knock the building well, down. I, I, I was working on that with Marion, and we worked very hard on it. Mm. Mm. And you did, you succeeded in, well, in saving it. Saving uh, it. And, and what is it now? It's all split up into... Yeah, it's at least the, the, the structure of the original uh, building is it there. It is there, yeah, yeah. yes. And then where the addition was at the back, that was demolished, and yeah, now you've yeah, got yeah. Uh, a block of... Flats up there now. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and the station, where would oh. that be uh, uh, dating from? Oh, the station. Well, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a, a stop there before there would be a, a sort of little wooden hut there. Yeah, yeah. That was Cross Lack Station. But uh, the railway came. Uh, about 1847, 1860, thereabouts, and of course originally, as we mentioned, it was a single line, uh, virtually paid for by the Squire Clifton from Lytham to uh, to Blackpool, uh, and uh, so uh, when St Anne's on the Sea was formed. Uh, then it became of its importance uh, and the station buildings uh, were developed uh, and uh, then shortly after that uh, the Preston to Lytham line was joined up 
and we had two railway lines come through. And then this magnificent station was built with the two platforms, uh, the southbound and then the northbound side, uh, with news agents on there, chocolate fries, chocolate vending machines, you could put a penny in the slot and out, pull out a bar of chocolate uh, and uh, the lighting was all gas lighting, I can remember going in the goods department there uh, uh, and as it got dark they pulled a handle on the end of a chain uh, and uh, all of a sudden the flame uh, would light up the whole uh, uh, of the goods department mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the railway station well it, it, it was very influential so many of the business people who worked in Manchester you know, like the cotton magnets and all these sort of people would get on the train in the morning at about eight o'clock and the train would go through as an express to Manchester into the centre of Manchester in time for them to get behind their big desk uh, to get to work and uh, they, they, they call oh uh, and on the I shouldn't be telling you all this, but on the way to Manchester, they formed a Moke Watchers Society. And the Moke Watchers, as the train went past a field near Moss Side, there was always a donkey in this field. And they, the Moke Watchers, had got a plan of this field divided up into sections. Okay. And the Moke Watchers would have a bet on where that donkey would be in that field uh, and the winner would, you know during the course of the journey the winner would collect the winnings from all these people the manchester business people uh, get the winnings for the day uh, and uh, once a year the milk watchers would have a dinner and dance at the grand hotel and it was only on those occasions would uh, the rest of them see what what the wives looked like you see mm. But, of course, there you are, the station developed uh, and the Manchester business people would uh, get off the train, uh, uh, you know, uh, northbound, and they'd spill out and they'd, they'd look at the St Anne's Hotel and the rat pit, named after the ratters, the golf caddies, and go down to this uh, to have a pint before going home. Uh, and... Uh, uh, they, uh, sometimes they, these Manchester business people, they were quite used to the antics that went on in the rat pit. Uh, and uh, a newcomer would be completely embarrassed because the, the lady who pulled the pints, she had stomach problems. And when she pulled a pint, at the same time as she pulled a pint, pint she broke wind and, and, and the new traveller would be terribly embarrassed at this and wouldn't know where to look but the rest of them were quite used to this <laughs> uh, and so the uh, uh, the service uh, from uh, the the goods which I, I remember mostly because my mother had a, a pram shop and whenever we wanted hoods uh, pram hoods uh, recovering. Uh, I would take these hoods to the goods uh, uh, section, the parcel section of the railway, uh, 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 all uh, wrapped up in brown paper uh, uh, and uh, the parcels man would have his brush there with uh, uh, a pot of uh, paste and he'd paste your label on the parcel and it would go off off to Lancaster it would go, to 69 Penny Street, Lancaster, but the people in Lancaster, they picked the parcels up from the station. Uh, any big parcels would, uh, would be delivered by horse and cart. And the, and the horse, the horses were still in existence in the fi early 50s. Uh, uh, and the horse would go around the shops with the deliveries. Uh, Marvellous service. Mm -hmm. uh, 
la la later on the horse is replaced with fully sort of three-wheeler vehicles with a trailer behind mm -hmm. and, and the three-wheeler railway vans uh, had uh, rubber mud guards which I thought were very practical mm -hmm. uh, but they, they, that platform carried on and, until I suppose Dr. Beeching came along yeah. and started yeah. making his cutbacks and so my, that's when we went to a single track yeah. and, and, and today there's great great concerns because so many people want to use the railway today as the, ra as the roads become more congested yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the frequency of the trains we only get one train a, an hour today whereas they're now talking about creating a passing loop somewhere and then we can have a, a half hourly service but the grandeur of that uh, of that station uh, is but a, but a distant memory now yes um, what about the um, the, the, the uh, cinema in St Anne's which was opposite the site entrance to the uh, park oh that was it Empire, the Empire cinema. Yes. cinema. I think that was a built, built about uh, 1920s. That, that was a very modern uh, cinema because before that was the Palace Cinema in Garden Street. Yes. But the Empire Cinema, magnificent place. Uh, you, you had a, a, a balcony up there uh, when I went as a child with my mother. Uh, we, we always sat in the best seats. I don't know why I was sat yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. I think my mother felt it was a sense of a special occasion. Red, plush, beautiful seats in the front balcony. Uh, and, and three shillings, three shillings and sixpence. The, uh, the upper circle behind that, I think that was about two shillings and ninepence. The back stalls were about one shilling and ninepence. Uh, and the front stalls, which were rubbish seats, for about sixpence uh, and uh, on a Saturday morning uh, us children would go along there to see the cartoons and the uh, Tarzan films and the cowboy films and would shout out like mad and, uh, uh, and uh, when, uh, when they did the continuous films in the morning whereby if you'd missed a film you could still stay in the cinema uh, and uh, see the next main film coming along or see what you'd missed. Mm -hmm. And in that gap between uh, one house and the next house, as children we would be there on the front row which must have done enormous damage to our eyes and our necks because on the front row your heads are cranked back looking up at the screen uh, and the most disconcerting thing was the usherette would come round during the period and spray us all with a disinfectant uh, thinking that we'd all got nits in our hair uh, but but the the man uh, oh they had a uh, quite a, a dressed up chap uh, uh, who was always at the main entrance to the cinema, dressed up in a beautiful maroon uh, uh, uniform with a peak cap on. Mm -hmm. Usually an ex-military chap mm -hmm. displaying the uh, coloured ribbons on his mm -hmm. thing. And it was really a sense of occasion going yeah. to the Empire. Uh, and uh, uh, le le we, we so many premier films are showed there. Uh, like the uh, oh what was it the Dam Busters mm. film mm. was shown there as a premiere where the Guy Gibson and all the famous people who appeared in that film they stayed at the Fernley Hotel and they put in a personal appearance they had a stage there and they would come up on the stage the thunderous applause really uh, yes oh. uh, and uh, uh, yeah and uh, uh, of, of course uh, Peter Wilson's famous film, uh, 
uh, about the uh, rage of sand. We actually showed that uh, as a premiere at the Empire Cinema. It took quite a, a lot of punching the light out using 60mm projector, but sure enough we did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, I, as television started coming to the fore, fewer people would go to the cinema and it, it changed from being a cinema, uh, it, for a short while it was a, a multi-studio cinema, but then that faded away and it became uh, a bingo hall. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, in, it, in its heyday, uh, the last owner was Edward Cook. I think you may know Edward Cook from Lytham. A uh, great local campaigner. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as it was due to close, because it was for demolition uh, to be converted into flats, and he was clearing out, he gave me a, a, a photograph. And it was all about the Orange Day. And this was when, once a year, the poor disadvantaged people of Manchester, uh, the children, would be brought to St Towns to the seaside. The taxi drivers from St Towns would go up to Manchester, collect all these boys, bring them to the seaside, and as a treat, they'd all go in the Empire Cinema during the day in a matinee to see the latest film <laughs> and everybody all the children who came in to see that film would be given an orange uh, and he, he had a photograph of all these boys being given an orange uh, but there you are that's my story uh, uh, of the yeah. Empire Cinema We've just got another one here another uh, one um, uh, what, the pier when did that open? Did it not be oh, open? the pier opened. The, that was a gradual opening. Yeah. Because about oh, about 1883, uh, they started with the pier. The the St Anne's Land and Building Company, in order to attract people to St Anne's, they said, we must we must have a pier. A pier will definitely attract people. Yeah. So a straightforward, simple beer pier was constructed, which went straight out. Uh, then at the end, there was a jetty, uh, a sloping jetty, which went to that landing stage where the paddle steamers would come to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, 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 then there was, then, uh, sure enough, that was a huge success. Yeah. Uh, because uh, on a, uh, the ladies, the finest ladies would dress up to go on the pier. Yeah. And when you see the early photographs of the pier, it's all people dressed up in the very best in the summer. They'd have these long flowing dresses with sun parasols in their hand. And it, it was a, a sight, it was a sight to believe. Yeah. Uh, absolutely incredible. And thousands of people would go on. Everyone who went on the pier had to pay a few pence at, entrance, it was a turnstile, I think the remains of the turnstile are still there, uh, but then the, the, the entrance to the pier was a little more than sort of like a wooden hut if you will, but that was embellished uh, until it ended up with what it looks like now, uh, the, the building, Accrington Brick, with an upper floor, with a, with a, uh, when you go in the upper floor, there's a, a, a big uh, cabinet meeting room there. Yeah, Great yeah. long table uh, and uh, all the mechanism for winding the clock is up there. Uh, and that that's where the St. Town's Land and Building Company yeah. used to hold their meetings up there. And from there, from that upper uh, front window, you can look straight down into the square. Marvellous views. Excuse me, Jens. Oh, the view. window clean is there. Oh, right. Can, can we break for one moment and I'll pick it up? Yes. 